Easter is great. It's one of the most famous and well-loved Bible stories, and the characters are so memorable. For example, if you read about what the Easter Bunny did, hmm, wait a second, let me try. Uh, no, no Easter Bunny. Well, then where did the Easter Bunny come from, and all this other stuff? We are going to talk about the story of the resurrection too, and I'll raise you one. We're going to talk about how the three days after the crucifixion, the exodus of the Israelites, and the rearrangement of heaven and hell are all the same story. And if that's not strange enough, we're going to assert that the details, the earthquake, the veil of the temple split in two, the stone rolled away, are telling a story about a change in the nature of reality, one that seriously affects the trajectory of each of our lives. Stay tuned. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Swedenborg in Life. It's the show where we take a look at life and we take a look at the anomaly that is the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg and we see where do these interse- intersect with each other and how can we get some benefit from it. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm the host. And if you want to be part of the show, get your questions and comments. And as always, we'll address those at the end of the program to the best of our ability. Before we start the show, take the part of your brain that you store theories of symbolism in and just do some stretches with that because we're going to be doing a lot of symbolic interpretation of stuff. There's going to need to be a few new shelves put up in there to hold all this stuff, but I hope in the end you're going to say, these are some of the best symbolic shelf dressings that I have. Okay, that went pretty well. Let's take a look at part one. We're going to talk about Easter. What exactly are we talking about? Because there's a couple of separate entities that, that are Easter. There's the biblical story of Easter, but then there's the modern Christian slash pagan slash secular festival that we have, which has all this kind of stuff in it. And when people see that stuff, there's some people, most people just like that stuff. I think Easter Bunny, that's cool. Hiding eggs, that's fun. Easter basket, that's great. Most of us just have a good time and and eat candy. But there's two groups of people that take issue in certain ways with this kind of stuff. And on one side, you have people saying, all this stuff, this all came out of pagan rituals. This, This is not biblical, so that proves that Easter is just something that the Christian powers that be back in the day kind of grafted some Bible stories onto. It proves that Easter isn't isn't really original and not really true, because it's just following in a long tradition in these of these kinds of things. And on the other side, you have people like, hey, we shouldn't have that stuff at all because it's not in the Bible. Uh, we're going to say today that this stuff belongs there, and it both reinforces the importance of the Easter story And it also makes it more, it expands because it's all in line with the same themes. And these themes are what the power of Easter is all about. All right, so there's the order. We'll see what happens with it. Let's begin by looking at the most famous one of these, arguably. This would be the Easter Bunny. So why... Why Easter Bunny? Why Easter and why Bunny? We're going to look at both words in that title. So let's start with the name of the holiday itself. Where does the word Easter come from? Um, So I think that most people actually know that Easter, uh, the Easter tradition and holiday, is almost entirely sort of overlaid on top of a much, much more ancient set of traditions. Um, Not a specific one, but... In this case, it is very specific. It's a Germanic goddess named Eastera or Ostera, but um, she has associations with renewal, rebirth of the year. Um, so it's a spring equinox tradition. And that's where we get a lot of our, um, I guess, more secular associations with Easter. 
So that's where the Easter and Easter Bunny comes from. What about the bunny part? And this is from discovery.com, so that's got to be true. According to the University of Florida Center, oh, so they're referencing these guys, Center for Children's Literature and Culture, the origin of the celebration and the origin of the Easter Bunny can be traced back to 13th century pre-Christian Germany, where people worshipped several gods and goddesses, the Teutonic deity Ustja was the goddess of spring and fertility, and feasts were held in her honor on the vernal equinox, as we heard. Her symbol was the rabbit because of the animal's high reproductive rate. So there you have that. That's where the Easter Bunny came from. But how does that fit in with the biblical narrative? And how does, and I forgot to mention this when we were talking about what we're going to do with all these symbols, how does what Swedenborg wrote reveal the connections between all these things, or maybe just strengthen the connections. This is what he had to say about the bunny as a spiritual symbol. This is Divine Love and Wisdom 316. As always, with these books, click them, download them for free, read them yourself, see if we misrepresented or properly represented what he's saying, There, or you want to learn more. There is a similar, and this is talking about that theme of abundance, there is a similar image of creation in the forms of the functions of the animal kingdom. For example, a body is formed from the seed and deposited in the womb or egg, a body that is its final form, and when this matures, it produces new seeds. The sequence is like the sequence of forms of functions in the plant kingdom. The seeds are the initial elements. The womb or the egg is like the soil. The state before birth is like the state of the seed in the earth while it is making its roots. The state after birth until reproduction is the sprouting of a tree until its fruit-bearing state. We can see from this parallelism that there is a likeness of creation in the animal forms just as there is in plant forms. The point is... Oh, oh, sorry, there's a second part. I'll get to the point. Specifically, there is a sequence from beginnings to limits and from limits to beginnings. In all such forms, there is some image of what is infinite infinite and eternal. We can see an image of the infinite in these forms from the tendency and potentiality of filling the space of the whole world and even of many worlds without end. There is a similar image of eternity in these processes. Seeds reproduce year after year, and the reproductions never cease. They have not paused from the creation of the world to the present, and they will not stop forever. So Swedenborg is saying that animals and plants are the, the generative powers and what they would accomplish if, you know, there, there wasn't predation, there weren't these limiting ecological factors, is an image of the infinity of God and of creation and of, and of the ongoing nature of divine things and of our own lives. And the rabbit is, is famous for being able to produce and produce a lot of offspring. So here you have this rabbit has crept its way into the Easter celebration, but this this is a symbol of the renewal of life and the power of God, which is also what the Easter story in the Bible is about, which we're going to get to in a minute. But first, let's look at some of these other symbols and see what kind of uh, further insight we can get on them. Eggs. So it might, it's not like an automatic, oh, you go from a bunny to an egg, because bunnies don't lay eggs, even though they're always pictured together. These using of eggs to celebrate is a tradition that's not just in the West. This is all over the world. You see some different kinds of eggs from all over the world, and it's an old tradition. There are even ostrich eggs that were decorated in this way thousands and thousands of years ago. So the egg is this symbol that's now in Easter, but it's it's been around the world for all kinds of things. And why? What What is this symbol of the egg, and why is it so prevalent in the human psyche? There's what's called a motif of the primordial egg. Uh, many, many motifs or many myths from across the world have a starting point of a unfertilized egg, a primordial egg from which the entire potential of the universe um, exists or expands from there. Um, and then again, breaking into this alchemy world, there is uh, just, uh, it would be impossible to try to bring in all of the different symbols there, but one way of looking at it would be alchemy's goal is is rebirth, just like the grail's goal is rebirth. Um, so the philosophical egg is something that comes into alchemy in text after text after text, and it's really sort of the, the product, the final product of the alchemical process. So in an interesting way, again, if you cut an egg in half, there are actually more layers than we might know. There's the shell, which is symbolic from the, again, in terms of directions and everything else, it's the earth element, or represents the earth element. Then there's a very thin um, membrane there, and that is seen as the air. Um, 
and then you have water in the middle, you have fire, that is that yolk, and then there's, uh, there's when an egg is actually fertilized, there's a little red spot in the middle of that yolk, which would be that final culminating. Um, a microcosm, if you will. And there's an interesting uh, connotation of egg as a descriptor of the progression of states in a human being. And Swedenborg talks about this in Secrets of Heaven 4378. He says, in the childlike stage of human rebirth, spiritual qualities are present in potential, since spiritual life gradually advances with each stage, starting with an egg. Childhood serves as a kind of egg for adolescence, which serves as a kind of egg for young adulthood, which serves as a kind of egg for full adulthood. It is as if we are constantly being born. And you see in the beginning of that quote, he's talking about spiritual rebirth. He talks about uh, the, the state of our minds, no matter how smart you are, and no matter how loving you are, how great you've become, you're like it's like you haven't even been born yet to the, the next stage of, of evolution of the human, individual evolution of the soul, that we can continue to grow in love and wisdom eternally and in, in these phases, like an egg. So the point we're making is, are all these images that have gotten hodgepodge together in Easter, is this actually providence bringing these together? Because these are all telling us about this great process of continual rebirth. I don't know. We don't know yet. We got to look at a few more elements. Springtime and flowers. Uh, who invented springtime and flowers? Was it the Christians? Nobody knows. Uh, so let's take a look. Secrets of Heaven 9553. Flowers symbolize facts about truth. Flowers have this symbolism because they are sproutings that precede and after a fashion actually produce fruits and seeds. After all, everyone knows that trees and other plants blossom before they bear fruit. It is the same with human beings and their understanding and wisdom. Facts about truth precede and, after a fashion, actually produce bits of wisdom in us, because they provide our rational mind with the subject matter of wisdom, and so with the means of growing wise. That is why facts about truth are like flowers. Goodness in our lives, wise goodness, is like the fruit. So if we're talking about eggs being a symbol of the ever-increasing stages of our growth, flowers are like the mechanism by which we grow. These are new ideas that are leading towards good action. So all these things, at first, I mean, they, they go together in an external way, you know, these young animals in the spring, but there's this spiritual connection between them too. And as we'll see as we get more into the themes of the biblical story of Easter, these all go with that as well. So there's another, I don't know if you guys, have you ever heard of this? People buy new clothes on Easter. I don't know if that's, if anyone's done that. It was a big thing a while ago. You used to get new clothes for Easter, and that was a tradition. And that, too, may have correspondential symbolic roots. Secrets of Heaven 4545. And be purified and change clothes in the Bible symbolizes a need to put on holiness. This is indicated by the symbolism of being purified or cleansed as becoming holy, and from that of changing clothes as putting something on. Here it means putting on sacred truth, because on an inner level of the word, clothes symbolize truth. Taking off clothes and being dressed in ceremonial clothing represented purification from falsity. You're not going to make it from one egg stage to another to another unless you can be purified from the things that are holding back growth. Physically, growth is all linear, meaning it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to go from 35 to 40 to 50, and your body's going to age in that way. But spiritually, we grow by voluntary action, by learning truth, by doing loving things. So the, the putting on of the new clothes in, in a symbolic sense, meaning the new, new um, substrate for the ideas in the mind, th that has to happen in order for us to go through this growth and rebirth that we've been talking about. And finally, we want to look at the date that Easter falls on. So what what determines Easter each year? It's on a different day every year. Where did all this come from? Let's take a look. Uh, this is timeanddate.com. In 325 CE, the Council of Nicaea, Swedenborg was not a fan, established that Easter would be held on the first Sunday after the full moon, first full moon occurring on or after the vernal equinox. So there you go, in case you wanted to know it. But the point that I want to make is that because of the way, there's another holiday, this is called Passover, maybe you've heard of it, and because of the way Easter is determined, Easter and Passover are not always back to back, but they're always close to each other. And why, why is there that connection between Easter and Passover? Let's take a look at that uh, here and see what we can find. 
We've never done that. We've never had me slip you into a new section without warning you that it was coming. So that's just that's just a taste of how brutal this episode is going to be. Uh, if you thought that was a lot of symbolism in the first one, hopefully you haven't filled up your shelves because this is going to get really intense in this section. This is how intense it is. Well, actually, this is that makes it sound too hyped up. I didn't know this stuff before we did this episode. It's not like I know everything. But as far as Swedenborg goes, um, I've spent a lot of time in the books, but I this was all news to me as we were putting this, studying this, putting it together. And there's a lot there, but it's awesome. So we got it. We have to do awesome things. Ergo, we do this section. Let's begin this whole thing with The Last Supper. The, is this the most famous painting of all time? It's up there. It's up there. Maybe Mona Lisa would be mad if she heard me say that. But this is Jesus and the disciples celebrating the Passover. And the crucifixion happened just after that. Was it a coincidence? No. There is this connection between the crucifixion and the Passover. And you could say, yeah, of course it is. You know, Jesus was Jewish and there was the Passover right before. But there's, a, there's more of a connection than you'd ever guess, according to Swedenborg, and we're going to look into it and and see how the stories connect. To begin, we did a, a short clip called Why God Became Man, which was out of the longer episode, the Why Jesus Was Born. If you haven't watched us at that episode, ignore this part here, but if you have, you may remember we had this little segment here that was sort of like a game board, and it showed the, the, the pre-existing spiritual conditions, according to Swedenborg, that made it, that pushed Jesus Christ into coming, or made it necessary for Jesus Christ to be born in order to clean things up here. If you saw that episode and you saw us say that, you might say, where is that in the Bible? How is that, how does the Bible tell you that any of that stuff happened? What we're saying here today is, actually, that is in the Bible, However, it's not in the stories about Jesus, it's in the stories about the Israelites. That actually, the story that inspired the Passover holiday, the captivity and the exodus from Egypt, that's the same one that is describing symbolically what happened with Jesus in, the, in, these, uh, in these stories. So we're going to take that clip we had before and expand on it, expand on this symbolism, and take a look. So let's see what we got. And I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians means that he descended to them to release them from the power of fact-type falsity, which tries to destroy the church's truth. However, the contents of this and the following verses hold an even greater mystery in their inner meaning. The church does not yet know that mystery, so it must be revealed. The people designated as spiritual are those who can be reborn only in regard to their intellectual part, not their will part. The Lord therefore grants a new will into their intellectual part, and this will harmonizes with the religious teachings of their church. These people, the spiritual, were saved only by the Lord's arrival in the world. The reason is that they were out of reach to the deity as he passed through heaven, or divine humanity as it existed before the Lord's coming. It could not reach them, because the teachings of their religion were mostly untrue, and the good in their will was accordingly not good. Since it was only the Lord's coming that could save them, they could not be taken up into heaven until then. Meanwhile, they were kept in the underground realm, and in places there that the word calls pits. This realm was hemmed in on all sides by the hells with their falsities, which made life miserable for the pit dwellers at that time. Nonetheless, the Lord was guarding them. After the Lord came into the world, though, and made the humanity in himself divine, he freed the people living in the pits and took them up to heaven. He also formed them into a spiritual heaven, the second heaven. That is what is meant by the Lord's descent to the lower regions and by his deliverance of the people imprisoned there. Was that confusing? We, put, we dropped you in there. Let me, let me back up and explain it a little bit. We did an episode called The Meaning of Noah's Flood. 
Uh, and in this episode, we talked about how there was originally a way the human mind worked in which thoughts and feelings were essentially one, but the will, our, our emotional aspect of us got so corrupted that we couldn't be good anymore. So the story of the flood is this metaphor for how that part of us was put down and this new way of being a person. We had of the ability to think one thing and feel another way and kind of struggle against yourself for the greater good that was put into place. So those spiritual people that it was talking about in that last clip there were people after the flood who had this new kind of mindset in them. And we're going to go into a lot more detail here about exactly what the whole situation was. So if you don't got it yet, you're going to get it now. We're going back to our game board to look at what was happening right after the crucifixion. Essentially, there were four... If so there, There's us, see, on that planet, there's all of us hanging out in the natural world, on planet Earth. Back before Jesus was resurrected, there was sort of four... This is after the flood, before Jesus was resurrected, there were basically four paths once you died in the natural world. The first one is that you could go up to the celestial heaven. Uh, so if you were... But this is like, if you were really, really good, meaning you had this wonderful understanding of truth, you lived directly from love, a few people could make it up to the celestial heaven. Generally, that was people before the flood. It wasn't the mindset of the people. It was very, very hard to be like that. The other option that we always have, you still have it today if you want it, is you can go down into hell be a demon there. You do it through uh, only caring about yourself, hating other people, cherishing revenge towards them, all kinds of nasty things. So yeah, there's that option, but then there's a couple of more. There is this place that, that wasn't yet heaven. It was just this expanse, which is symbolized, as we're going to get to in a minute, by the promised land in the Bible. And there were, in that space, simple, good people. And it seems like that might be a great spot for them, but the situation was a little more complicated. We're going to get back to that in a minute, so hold that in your mind. The other place worth talking about is a realm that Swedenborg calls the Lower Earth. And this is where Swedenborg says people who, and this was what we were talking about in that video, people who were regenerated, these were people who wanted to be good people, uh, were led by their thoughts to become good people, but they, they couldn't go into the celestial heaven. They didn't have that kind of mind. And if you know anything about Swedenborg's descriptions of heaven, you've got to have the right kind of mindset to get into to, that jives with the heaven around you, or else you can't even really breathe. So these people needed a different sort of home for them. However, there was no they weren't quite ready to make their own heaven. So instead, they were in this protected area that was outside hell, but wasn't in heaven, but was surrounded by hell. And because it, they were protected, so they couldn't be really harmed, however, hell bothered them. Hell could still get at them a bit, make life less than pleasant for them. They were trying to destroy them, but they couldn't get through. But overall, it's like living around a bad neighborhood. Some things trickle through. There wasn't happiness, okay? So there you have your scene. However, I said we're going to go back to the promised land. And if you're getting lost, remember, you can just skip back watch this thing again. <laughs> the promised land, it was more complicated than just those simple yellow people there. There were actually demons in the promised land who, though, because they were up there and because there were these simple good people around, those demons, this Swedenborg says, because of the good people around, the demons could act like upright, decent people because they were held in check by two things. One, the angels in the celestial heaven were tempering them, and two, they wanted to seem good in front of these good people so that they would get put in positions of power and prominence. So you had in there, actually, in that place that was going to become heaven, these sort of evil spirits and these naive people getting led around by them. And why Why would God allow like a strange mixture like that to happen? It's because there has to be somebody there, because the way that the divine this is this is a lot i'm glad you're listening to it the way the divine connects with the human race is successively through levels meaning first the divine goes into angels then had to go through this place to get to us on earth you had to have somebody 
there, okay? However, this is not an ideal setup. You have this sort of uh, people being misled in the middle and, and not fully happy of the people down in the pit are not that happy, all kinds of trouble. So how are we going to clean this whole mess up? I'm glad you asked. We're going to do it through Jesus Christ. There's Jesus, normal person in our world. However, through the process he was going through in his life, became the divine human, right? Now, I guess not a normal person, but human that, that was divine from the inside eventually was this full embodiment of the divine. So once Jesus completed his mission on earth, which ended with the crucifixion, then the Swedenborg says, in those days intervening, he went on this whirlwind tour of the world of spirits, patching everything up. The first thing that he did was go to that lower earth, because now that he had connected, see how he's this connector point to the divine there, he could pull those people up and through a series, and and have them go through this series of sort of trials, like we all go through, that they needed to, so they could free their minds up enough, he took them, was able to bring them into the promised land, and from there, create this new heaven. And because of the presence of those people, the demons lost their ability to feign goodness, and they were pushed out. And from that, what was referred to as the promised land, just this potential, became the spiritual heaven. Does that? Did I say that too loud? The reason that's exciting is Swedenborg talks about there's three heavens. There's a celestial heaven, there's a spiritual heaven, there's a natural heaven. But the spiritual heaven wasn't always there. It's a relative newcomer. You know, that that was made for these particular people. That's what Jesus did. Well, there, hopefully my Swedenborg nerdism showed through there, and hopefully you wake, wake up, wake up. Okay, that is how the spiritual heaven was made, if you were wondering. And that is what was going on with Jesus Christ. And that is also what is this, what the story is that's being told in the Bible. Why are there so many passages about captives and freedom? Even after they are out of Egypt, you see all, all across the prophets and that kind of stuff, is talking about the prisoners, freeing the prisoners, freeing the prisoners. Swedenborg says that that is about these spiritual prisoners as well, that this is about all these people who are trapped in this gloomy sort of afterlife, getting pulled up, and finally a heaven being made where they could live and grow and love. And Swedenborg says that is That story I just told you, it might seem like, where did you get that? That is not at all told in the Bible, if you you happen to think the Bible is an authority on this kind of stuff. But Swedenborg says it's there, but it's, it's, it's told metaphorically, like all things in the Bible, our correspondences. I'll point out to you exactly which stories represent what. So first... You have this, these captives in the lower earth. That's the Israelites. That the reason why we're why are we focusing on the this one group of people on earth? Because it is this symbolic representation of these people captive in the spiritual world, and everything is a microcosm. So that's a part of us that's trapped in our own hell and heaven, in in our own minds until the Lord can come. So then. When Jesus came, that's Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses is a Christ figure. As, they, as you, you take English class in high school, they, everyone's a Christ figure. Moses is a Christ figure because he is representing the Lord who leads this element out of there and up. However, as you'll know, the Israelites don't just get there immediately. The struggles, the wilderness, everything they had to go through, these are those trials that I said those people had to go through to get to the promised land, because they had to be prepared. Just like we in life have to struggle, we have to go through temptations or whatever Swedenborg calls them, shattering experiences sometimes, before we're ready to accept the heavenly mindset. Everyone has to do that. That's why it had to happen here. But then finally, once the Israelites get into the promised land, there's all this the fighting with cities and and other peoples, and why is that divine? It's because it's a symbol of this kicking the hell out of the spot that's going to become heaven. So, there you have it. I hope you survived. But that, to me, that's fascinating to me. It's a lot, but that is, that is what's going on. It, what happened after Jesus was crucified. It's the reason why the Bible focuses on those stories, which might seem strange. What, why is the Bible focusing on that? And, uh, and it's why there's... A, if you're ever looking at Swedenborg and say, why are there these three heavens? 
that's why there's one of them. Uh, so there's that. And is there any other way that we could possibly confirm something like this besides Swedenborg? I don't think so. But there might be indicators that point in that direction. You do have a lot of people, a lot of cultures that had sort of a gloomy ver or, you know, less, less uh, differentiated version of the afterlife. And these are cultures that would occur during the time period that Swedenborg said the world of spirits was like that, when people would go kind of into this lower earth and sort of be harassed. So is that is that an indicator? Well, here's a couple examples uh, of what I'm talking about. In a lot of ways, the term underworld is a misnomer. Uh, it's not a misnomer for the way it was meant, but in a post-Christianity world, we are, in a, in a lot of ways, much more dualistic than the ancient mind was. The ancient mind, the underworld, or the afterlife, it isn't clearly split up into a good afterlife and a bad afterlife, or anything like that. It is uh, it's seen as purely that, the underworld. After you pass away, you move on, and there isn't a necessarily a... Um, purgatory or dark or sinister quality to it, but it is almost more of a murky, undifferentiated symbol. In, in Greek and Roman uh, mythologies, it's almost more like a symbol of depression than anything else. Uh, when the epic hero dies, uh, he uh, is, in a ghost sense of way, he moves into this afterworld and if he is ever able to be brought back again, or if he is able, if it is actually a his partner that he's retrieving, like Orpheus, in all cases, it's sort of a trying to bring them up from this depressive, sort of gloomy underworld. Now, that fine gentleman is not saying that people had that myth because that's how the spiritual world used to be, according to Swedenborg, and I can't confirm that either. It's pure speculation, but could it be that really the afterlife was different for a little while there in certain ways, and that showed through in the cultures of the people who were interacting with it? I don't know. Okay, that was one... We're not even done with connections between the Passover and Easter. That was one point of connection there, a strong one. However, there's another connection between the two, and that is this animal here. Uh, so Jesus is called the lamb, or the lamb who is slain. Uh, but also, I don't know if you if you know the story of Passover. Originally, they, they took lamb's blood and put it above their doors to stave off the angel of death uh, when the Egyptians were having their firstborn killed. Uh, and then ever since then, there would be a ritual you know, in, in the ancient Israelitish culture and described in the Bible. There would be this ritual where they would use the same thing to, to mark that occasion. So we want to look at that. Why, why a lamb and why blood? Why, why is there this connection? Because Jesus has talked about as a lamb and the importance of his blood as it's spilled. So first, let's take a look at why, why is blood involved at all? It seems a little bit blah. Is there, is there a reason why it's used as a symbol? If you read the Bible, it becomes very apparent that it's a fairly bloody book. Um, in, in ancient times, ancient Israel, that and the tabernacle times, there was um, animal sacrifices, and they had to do all these very particular things with the blood. And um, so if you really think about it, it must have been a very bloody place. Um, and part of that, Swedenborg says, is that the blood is this really important, valuable symbol. It has a very special correspondence. Um, but, but the culture of the time was just used to sacrifices, making animal sacrifices. They thought that that was so important. And so <clears throat> the Lord allows that form to exist because it carries the symbol of the blood even though the external form of it of like killing animals isn't necessarily something um, God wants people to do. Obviously Jesus is crucified and there's all this talk of his blood and he and he uses the image of blood to um, obviously be conveying this deeper symbolism but uh, Again, he's not necessarily talking about physical blood. That's not the point. There's this inner meaning to it. And um, 
Jesus said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So he himself was just clearing up. This sacrifice thing isn't exactly what this is all about. There's this inner meaning to this whole symbolism of blood. So even though Jesus was clear about desiring mercy and not sacrifice, people still are left with this idea that his death and crucifixion was somehow like the blood of it was something that appeased the father because of this idea that Jesus is somehow not the father, even though he says, I and the father are one. You, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. So really there, there's a oneness there, but people have maintained this sort of misunderstanding that his crucifixion is a sacrifice itself. Um, and that that's the importance of the blood. But the what Swedenborg says is that blood is, um, if you think about it, you know, water, there's the water of baptism, you know, this, that's a symbol of truth. Jesus is the word made flesh. And so it's, it's the living word. And that, and that's what blood is, is it's if, you know, we drink water to hydrate ourselves, but then it warms up in our body and our heart is pumping it. So it becomes this warm lifeblood to us and enables us to live things. So blood is really the symbol of living truth. And that's why it is such an important symbol in the Bible. That you're, you're saved by the blood of Jesus. How are you saved by the blood of Jesus? How does that work? If blood is a symbol of love and truth in action being lived, then you're saved, meaning you're, you're on the, your way to heaven through loving actions based on what's true. That's the whole of regeneration as Swedenborg described. So that is how your that is how the blood of Jesus is affecting you. Think about it as the life force of God, of the divine human, that if you're if you're in that stream, that's how the blood is saving you, right? So there's a little bit about blood, but what what's the symbolism of a lamb? Why why do we have that tied into both of these stories? Jesus was crucified, but then he was, that was what brought on his um, glorification and being resurrected. His crucifixion was an image of the violence that had been done to truth, just the way that the people of that time had um, taken, forgotten about the love that was really meant to be the life of this, of true ideas. So by glorifying his human nature, the Lord was really bringing everything, even that, um, those lowest places or the worst that could be done, you know, violence against the divine love itself, um, back into the divine design. By letting even that happen, the Lord was bringing his love to even that furthest place. And that, so even, even the worst of the worst is something that the Lord can, um, bring back into the divine design. And so that's why it had to happen that way to show that even, even that isn't out of the reach of love's ability to bring it back into a, you know, a glorified form, one that's reconnected to love. Even when the Lord is on the cross in his human nature, um, you know, he went through different states of feeling at one with divine love itself and at other times more caught up in his human nature um, that experienced a sense of separateness. Um, even in that state, he he says the prayer, you know, if, it, uh, if it's at all possible, take this cup away from me, but then says, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's why the image of him as a lamb and the blood of a lamb is used because a lamb is an image of this innocence, which innocence is really just a willingness to be led by the Lord. And so even the Lord himself in his sense of separateness from divine love, maybe didn't totally see how being crucified was accomplishing some very important part of, you know, the Lord's life in, in this world. He was willing to follow divine love to be um, knowing that even this was part of the divine design, this process of being crucified. And so um, even in this worst act, he becomes, you know, the epitome of innocence itself, which is just ever more so than something that divine love can come into and glorify. And so then he becomes, his human nature becomes glorified and becomes one with divine love. 
So we're going to look a lot more at innocence. But I hope what you could pick up there is that there it doesn't mean just because something is a symbol does not mean the action itself is condoned obviously animal sacrifice is not something we all today realize this is not that is not okay things like wars in the bible it's not like these are these are prescribed and condoned but there's it's a symbol from the story so the lamb and the blood this is symbolic of this living from a life of love and truth and this innocence so let's look a little bit more at at what this innocence is secrets of heaven 7846 and they shall take some of the blood of the passover lamb symbolizes sacred truth rising out of innocent goodness This is established by the symbolism of blood as sacred truth radiating from the Lord. This blood was from a lamb, and the lamb symbolizes innocent goodness. So the blood stands for sacred truth rising out of innocent goodness. Okay, so we got that. Let's go a little bit farther into what innocence is. This is Revelation Unveiled, also titled Apocalypse Revealed in older translations, number 379. And have whitened their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So this is from the book of Revelation, where again, this Lamb and blood symbolism comes up. means they have also purified themselves from malicious falsities by means of truths, and in this way have been reformed by the Lord. So you have this being, this is a symbol of purification, again, of regeneration, of spiritual growth and progress. And then Secrets of Heaven, 3994. The Lord, and this is talking more about what in it, what is innocence? The Lord is innocence itself, the innocence in his kingdom, because every trace of innocence comes from him, which is why he is called the Lamb. In the highest sense, the Passover Lamb is the Lord, because Passover symbolized the Lord's transformation, or the robbing of his human part in divinity. In a representative sense, it symbolized human rebirth, and the Passover Lamb symbolizes the vital element in rebirth, which is innocence. No one can be regenerated except by charity that contains innocence. So you've got to have innocence or you can't be reborn. We've all got to adopt it. And Swedenborg talks about how innocence is not necessarily how you would think, uh, you know, not knowing evil is often how we depict it or, or what we think the definition is of it. But it's actually a willingness to be led by the divine. That is the definition of innocence, a willingness to be led by love and truth rather than by selfish desire. That is innocence. And that the Lord, Jesus Christ, was the most innocent because he was willing to be led by the divine design, even if it meant he was going to have to suffer the crucifixion, even if it seemed like things weren't going to go well, he knew this is the most loving way. So he was led by that in totality. True Christianity 706, the angels in heaven are unable to think about any blood or about the Lord's suffering. They think instead about the divine truth and about his resurrection. When we think about the Lord's blood, angels think instead about the divine truth of the Lord's word. When we think about the Lord's suffering, they think instead about the Lord's glorification, focusing exclusively on his resurrection. A great deal of experience has allowed me to know that this is the case. So it sort of seems like the angels are opposite of what people are here. I think about like the movie The Passion of the Christ that is entirely focused on the blood and the suffering. You know, I actually haven't seen it, but that's what I heard anyway. <laughs> so now I'm an expert. So, but but this leads to if the point wasn't, you know, people people pay attention to that. It could be for a good purpose because they think this is what mattered was the suffering on the cross. If we're saying that it wasn't the suffering on the cross. Why Why did he die on the cross? Well, that's not this show. We're talking about the resurrection, this show. However, we did cover that very subject in an episode we called The Spiritual Battles of Jesus Christ, so click on that one if you're looking for the meaning of the cross itself. However, a lot more meaning to come in this episode, because if you read the Easter story, there, there are the big parts that everybody knows, Jesus was crucified, Jesus rose, but there's all these little details. And Swedenborg says everything in, the, in these stories is divine and divinely symbolic. So all these, there, there's no frivolous details. What do they mean? We're going to take a look at a few of them in part three.
So at run through, some people were like, what, what is that? What is veil insurance claims? And let me tell you, there's a part where the, in the Bible where the veil splits in two. And I'm picturing somebody who perhaps like had insured that veil and, and they call their, their insurance agent and say, I want to process a claim on this veil. And the person might say, well, why did your veil split in two? Because you may or may not be covered, depending on why. So here we're going to learn why exactly that happened. But first, we're going to look at the earthquake. At, just after Jesus was crucified, there was an earthquake. Swedenborg says that that symbolized a change in the church. And the church is not just the religious organization that Jesus was going to start or that was going to be kicked off because of of that event, you know, which is Christianity, but also a change in the way the human mind worked. And we saw that change play out in the spiritual world in that you know, game board thing, that map thing that we had in the last section. Now, the veil splitting in two. Why? The separation between the outer humanity of Jesus and his inner divine soul was now gone. The two were completely united as one. External doctrine that blocked people from seeing the true qualities of God could now be pulled aside. The veil was what separated the parts in the temple. There's a certain part, this is a holier part than this part, so there, there's no communication. But now the veil, Swedenborg says, the veil split in that temple because it was symbolic of this joining together that came through the work of Jesus Christ that not only connected the divine human to the divine, but connect something in all of our mind and pulled away these things that were blocking us from fully receiving the divine truth. You may have heard there's a strange little part about the graves being opened and people coming out, and Swedenborg describes the meaning of this in Apocalypse Explained 659. It is recorded in Matthew that after the passion of the Lord, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of those that slept came out of their tombs, went into the holy city, and appeared to many. The tombs being opened, and many bodies of them that slept appearing, represent the regeneration of the faithful and their resurrection unto life. Not that the bodies themselves, which lay in the tombs, rose again, but there, that there was the appearance of this in order that both regeneration and resurrection unto life from the Lord might be signified. Moreover, these same words mean that those who are said in the word to be bound in the pit whom the Lord liberated after he had finished the whole work of redemption, which is what we were looking at before. Again, spiritual rebirth is this regeneration of soul. It's not about coming back into the body. For many of the faithful could not be saved until the Lord had come into the world and subjugated the hells. In the meantime, they were detained in places which are called pits, even up to the coming of the Lord, and they were liberated by the Lord immediately after his coming. See, told you, <laughs> told you Swedenborg said so. These pits were also represented by the tombs that were opened and those who were therein by those that slept. Who, appear, who after the Lord's resurrection, as it is said, appeared to many in the holy city. The holy city was Zion and Jerusalem, but by these is meant heaven, whither they were raised up by the Lord, for both Zion and Jerusalem were rather, were rather profane than holy. Again, Secrets of Heaven 9229, this is a similar subject to that. The real reason Jerusalem is called holy, this is not because of this physical city, how it was then on earth, is that it symbolized the Lord's kingdom in the church. The appearance of dead saints there in a vision seen by several observers symbolized the fact that people in the spiritual church were taken and were eventually, were saved and were eventually taken up to the holy city, meaning heaven. Until that time, they were kept in an underground realm. So this is symbol after symbol after symbol uh, that Swedenborg talks about, and we're, we're bombarding you with, with them this episode because this is a lot of the Swedenborg message, is that not just the things in the Bible, but everything is symbolic of something else. Everything teaches you deeper truths. There's the literal what it's happening at face value, but then there's something deeper and deeper you can learn from everything. And if we can learn to speak this language, suddenly you wouldn't ever need to watch this show again, <laughs> because then you could look at anything and learn and know and have perception about all the mysteries of God and heaven. So we slowly try to learn these things, uh, and hopefully someday get to that state. So I want to bring us back to the symbolism of another current Easter tradition, um, which is the Easter basket. Um, so that is going to be tied to this despair that we, that we had in that picture of uh, the, dis that the disciples went through after expectations were gone. So we will scroll up again. Um, there was the disciples, and they thought 
Jesus Christ is going to come and he is going to lead us into a new kingdom and that is going to um, change the world. But then all of a sudden he's dead. He's dead and it's over. And so that think about the despair that they were feeling then. I mean, that is such an intense um, loss. You know, that they're, they're not going to be able to, to re- recall anything. So this is that hunt they had to go on for not just Jesus Christ, like we go and hunt for, for treats, but they were hunting for a new way to understand life, that how are we going to go on and have hope? All right, so then these are the sequence of events that happened after that. The angel rolled away the stone. The angel rolling back the stone. Rolling away the stone means the Lord was removing all falsity because stones can be a symbol of falsity or truth, depending on context, that had been blocking people from approaching God. Divine truth was being opened up. So that stone might seem like some old thing in an old story, but it's affecting the way we currently in our lives are getting messages from heaven, even though we don't realize it. All the the higher concepts in us are coming because that stone is gone. Then we had the guards fainting. The women were terrified when they saw it. The suddenly the sudden appearance of a heavenly presence at first causes either a collapse or fear as people realize how weak their own lives are in comparison to the power of the Lord's life. You know, if you just got if you almost got hit by something huge but it just missed it. Wow. That is powerful. And then you also had this Jesus appearing to people in a locked room. And this is, this is an interesting little t- tangent or point that Swedenborg goes on. After his work on earth was finished, Jesus Christ was completely purified, and everything about him became divine, including his physical body. His body could now cross between the spiritual and physical worlds and operate in both. He could suddenly appear in a locked room like a spirit, and yet could also eat physical food and be touched physically, as when Thomas asked to touch the wounds on his hands. Why did he have those? If he was a spirit, isn't the spirit made whole? Swedenborg says that the work that Jesus did, I mean, that, that was such an intense thing that actually the physical body became spiritual. And never, you never had before physical material becoming spiritual, but there was a, somehow this connection that still that didn't suspend the laws of physical or spiritual order, but somehow Jesus could actually have that body so he could be divine and spiritual but interact with the physical world. Pretty good trick. Uh, so you, at this point, I'm sure... If you haven't turned off the show, you're saying, how? where do you get off saying that all these points of the story have symbolic detail about Jesus Christ, about the divine human in them? Jesus never said, the Bible never says that's how it is. Jesus never says that's how it is. Or does he? There's a story after the crucifixion where there are a couple of disciples walking down, perhaps you've heard it, the road to Emmaus, and they meet a stranger, and a conversation ensues. And I'll I'll let you hear the rest of it here. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded to them that 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 uh, that ended up being Jesus. You know, they they got their eyes open. They sat down, broke bread. They got their eyes open, recognized him. Uh, or you know, afterwards on there, uh, they they knew that that was Jesus. So Jesus is going back through the Old Testament and saying, here's all the details about me in all the scriptures. It says all the scriptures. We've done a little bit of that here tonight, told the details of Jesus, which it might seem like, why are we talking about Jesus? But what Jesus does is affects everyone always. God is independent of time and space. It's as much happening in our individual lives as it did in the story of the people being liberated in heaven. But that's showing Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus. He's telling those disciples, look, the, this is how the Old Testament, the rest of it's about me, and the New Testament as well, um, which which hadn't been written but was being acted out in this same symbolic way. It's just like us saying, um, w- here's how the Israelites' Exodus story mirrored what Jesus did. That this is how the whole text is written, and that's why it's divine. And further in Luke, this is 24, 
verse 32, And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the Scriptures to us? If he's opening the Scriptures to them, what's he, what's he open? What's in there? If he opens the Scriptures to them and it's just all the same as it was before, there's got to be a whole new meaning in there. And this new meaning, well, this was one of Swedenborg's great missions, was saying, look, I've been shown what this meaning is. And that that is going to be the found. This meaning, this internal meaning, is going to be the foundation of this whole new way that God and humanity relate to each other, and it's going to kick off this great new era. And so that was why, part of why, he was so determined in his mission to catalog it all, write it down, so that we could make really long, <laughs> intense, uh, cluttered shows about it. Are you not entertained? Okay, that is why the symbolism is there. This may all still seem a little removed from our personal lives. So let's take a look in the next section at how does this same story show up for each of us? All right, so we're going to talk about how how does the individual Easter happen? How does this story get reflected in us? Think about back to the despair of the disciples, because they thought that Jesus Christ, they were completely enamored with this person. This guy came in, I was, I was fishing, it wasn't a great life, I, I didn't know where I was going. This guy shows up, suddenly we're all rock stars, everyone wants to follow us around, he's teaching us these amazing things, we, we, we love him, he's awesome, and he's going he's gonna to liberate our people from the Roman captivity, he's going to make this kingdom, it's going to be awesome, and then he's dead. And, and suddenly everything they were planning their life around is gone, nothing remains, uh, was it all, wait, he died? Was he just making it up the whole time? How Was he not really this thing he said he was? So think about that. W- what in your life feels like that? You know, what is, what is that crushing? We go through these kinds of deaths, and I'm, we're going to show how in our lives we follow the same pattern of resurrection, that it does come back to life. First, let's look at this period of three days, that Jesus was dead for three days, and this is a journey, this, that's a symbolic period that shows up for, for not just in the Jesus story, but it shows up all over because it is this common human theme, as we can hear about some here. As a general motif, uh, there is the, there's a lot of different names for it. There's the dying and resurrection God. That term has lost some of its uh, glimmer because uh, people question just how universal it is, but there is a, a more specific term which would be the nekia, uh, which sort of means, officially means sort of a night journey or the night sea journey, and that is really an interesting motif because it comes into a whole lot of different stories on a less literal way. The, the day journey would be you travel from the womb, the literal womb, to the womb of the earth, which is a tomb of different sorts, so of course it makes a lot of sense that there would be that night journey as well, which symbolically takes three days and then a new um, transcendent person or God emerges from that womb. Uh, Some other examples from the Bible would be Jonah and the whale, and that's where you see it really is a womb. Um, The tomb isn't always literally a tomb. Uh, Jonah is fleeing from his destiny, he gets swallowed up by a whale, and he is in that whale for three days before really being born again onto the shore uh, with a new set of purpose, or a new sense of purpose um, moving forward. But again, not all of them are biblical and not all of them are quite so literal. Uh, Very similar to the Jonah story would actually be the story of Pinocchio. He's again, just like Jonah, he's fleeing from his, uh, his destiny, always fleeing away from it, and eventually that gets him in more and more trouble, and he sort of has a moment of courage where his father figure, Geppetto, is swallowed by the whale. He goes and is swallowed as well, again in that womb for three days of darkness. Uh, it's actually a kind of renewal, it's not all bad. Um, and he's reborn, in that sense, very literally, he's, that's 
every gives him everything he needs to become a real boy. Um, so it really is a second life, um, more real than the first. Another s sort of uh, falling into that motif that many people wouldn't think about would actually be the Aladdin story. Uh, he goes along, he's a kid that uh, is sort of almost pathologically lazy. Um, it actually leads to his father's death and heartbreak because his father wants him to take on a career and do something of his life. Um, so it's actually his lack of ambition that leads him to being tricked, foolishly tricked, into going into this cave. Um, and he's trapped in there for three days, of course, and he emerges with an image of his own soul, the genie, which of course directs him on a new path and uh, leading in that way. In Jonah, in Pinocchio, in Aladdin, uh, what do those three-day night journeys all have in common? They come out the other side in a much better place. There's, a, Even though it's painful and scary, on the other side it's like this is your destiny, this is what you were supposed to fulfill, and the promise is that even though we go through this heartbreak, there is something waiting for us, that the cycle is guaranteed to come back up, and we will be so much more than we were before. Secrets of Heaven 720 talks about the, the number in the third day. In the word, the third day is interchangeable with the seventh. Those have the same sort of symbolism and involves almost the same meaning. This is because of the Lord's resurrection on the third day. For the same reason, just as the seventh day speaks of the Lord's entry into the world and into His glory, and, as, and all the other times He comes as well, so also does the third day. And then Secrets of Heaven 901 goes on to talk a little more. Three symbolizes the same thing as seven, holiness. The secret reason is that the Lord rose again on the third day. Okay, we got that. The Lord's resurrection in itself involves everything that is sacred and entails the resurrection of all people. So there you, that he's saying it plainly, what is described to the Lord re is reflected in all of us. This is why the Jewish religion came to use this number in a representative way and why it is a holy number in the Word. The situation resembles that in heaven, where there are no numbers. A generalized and reverent idea of the Lord's resurrection and of His arrival in the world replaces the numbers 3 and 7 there. So not that there are no numbers in heaven, Swedenborg describes numbers in heaven, we'll do a show on it sometime, but in, the, in what their spiritual version of the Word, it's, there's a rever just a reverent concept there, of the meaning behind it. They, all this stuff, the symbolism we're trying to get at here, they see only the symbolism. They don't even see the literal sense of the whole thing. So when, when we have resurrection as well, and it can happen for us when we go through these hard things, but come out of that into these new perspectives or these new ways of looking at life. This is Secrets of Heaven 2916. Matthew 27, 52, 53 says that the graves opened and many bodies of sleeping saints rose again and left their graves after the Lord's resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. We looked at that already. This involves the same meaning, namely rising again because of the Lord's resurrection and in a deep, deeper sense, every resurrection. And this is not, this is our resurrection after death, but also our resurrection in life. And to get back to that Go back into your place of despair, your despair place that I talked about in the beginning. Think about a time in life when it felt like you were completely, like you were crushed. Something was dead. The most important thing in your life was dead, or something of great importance, and it seemed like, how is life going to continue? And this can be in a big or a small way, but what what's going to happen? And then think about the way that life sprung again, or maybe it hasn't yet for you. Maybe you're right in that. In that case, think about if, if any of us had never seen winter before. We didn't understand the cycles of it, and suddenly it started to get colder, and all the trees dropped their leaves, all the plants started to die, it was getting colder and colder, Things started, water started to freeze. You would think, this is the end of the world. Everything is dying. Uh, the animals are gone. The insects are gone. The plants are basically gone, and it just keeps getting colder. You would think it, it's never going to be like it was, but we know that actually it comes back, and that everything, the seasons, 
are, are the Lord speaking to us, telling us, don't worry, it's going to come back. So we're going to look at some images uh, in our correspondences segment of the seasons, and we're going to go from winter when it's all frozen through into spring and be thinking about how the same thing happens in each of our lives. talking about the prisoners, you know, because we are prisoners in our own way. We think we're trapped in negative ways of thinking, we're trapped in various kinds of hurt, various kinds of despair. You know, you don't need me to tell you about this. You've lived a life, you know what it's like to be crushed in little and big ways. And so we're when we talk about this freeing of the captives, that's us that God is coming to free as well. And we're being freed from different things, but the the experience, the archetypal story is the same thing, that we're trapped and there's a period of suffering, but then there is a period of liberation. The truth will set you free. That's actually true. It does set us free. In Secrets of Heaven 6854, the prisoners stand in a narrow sense for spirits held in the underground realm until the Lord's coming, which we talked about when they were taken up into heaven. In a broad sense, they stand for everyone of good intent who is essentially held captive by falsity but wants to struggle free of it. And falsity, that could be thinking that something that, that w- when something dies, there's not going to be a resurrection, that's a falsity. Thinking that, uh, that you, there's not hope, that's a falsity. It doesn't seem like it, but it is, and we're trapped by those. If we, if we saw things for how they really were, we would be freed. You would be in the mind of heaven, a place where it's, it's all happiness. So all this suffering that we go through is because it's not that we can just break out of it. It's very real and it's very painful, but the promise is that that's the, that's the whole point of everything. That's what God is doing, is coming to free us. You, this, is, this is what being saved by Jesus Christ is. God is coming to pull us out, and he, the way that He comes is like the dawn. If you think about all, like the cycles of the seasons are telling us something, the cycles of the days are telling us something. And it, you know, it's a little hard to catch a sunrise sometimes because it happens real early. But if you see one, you can feel it. This is a promise of some kind, or this this is the beginning of something. And Swedenborg says that 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 dawn, that feeling, that is that is an image, a correspondence of the Lord. And here he describes it in Secrets of Heaven twenty four oh five. Since in its proper sense morning symbolizes the Lord, His coming, and so the arrival of His kingdom, it also symbolizes the dawn of a new religion, the Church being the Lord's kingdom on earth. This dawn occurs both in general and in particular, and even in specific detail. In general, when some church is being revived on earth, in particular, when an individual is reborn and becomes a new person, In such people, the Lord's kingdom then dawns, and each of them becomes a church. In specific detail, whenever love and faith have a good effect on this individual, because that is what the Lord's coming consists in. As a result, the Lord's resurrection on the third day in the morning involves all these meanings. It even involves the particular and detailed ones, since he rises again in the minds of regenerate people daily, and in fact, from moment to moment. So how is your symbolic brain storage area? Overflowing? Hopefully so, and hopefully in a positive way. If you enjoyed it all, what we served up today, please like and subscribe. That helps get this video out into YouTube, and hopefully someone who is looking for, happens to have some shelves available, finds it uh, and likes it. So, We are going to get to the questions and comments, as we always do, but first, a quick message from us, the Swedenborg Foundation, to you, our friends. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. 
The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. All right. Questions it is. <laughs> there wouldn't be any questions about this show. Everything was clear, right? All right. Let's take a look. Does anybody have anything? Question number one. Zeke, is it wrong to avoid people who have let evil take them over? I don't drink alcohol, so I don't go to bars, but I have gone to churches and found people who have succumbed to evil, too. Eh, you don't know. It doesn't. It's not like uh, you he, in the physical world space it doesn't have a moral component to it you can be a real bad person but go into a place like a church that is that is meant to be some kind of holy place spiritually works differently the point is you can absolutely avoid things i mean anybody who has been an alcoholic uh, you know that's part of recovery as i understand it is if you need to not go into a bar because you can't uh, handle it that certainly makes sense and you you don't just have to be around people all the time if you feel like they're dangerous or they're dragging you down or something like that it's um it's called wise wise loving you know you part you do want to you don't want to hate anyone you don't want to hold anyone in contempt you you want to wish for everyone's happiness but sometimes you got to take yourself out of proximity with a person because it's a danger to you it's a danger to others and letting yourself be harmed by someone is not good for either of you. It's bad for you because you're getting hurt. It's bad for them because they're getting to perpetuate the hurt without having consequences, which may include you not wanting to be around them. So I think it's certainly fine to avoid. You just want to make sure that when you feel like you can do some good, clearly, without putting yourself or others at risk, you, you don't pass that up just because you're like, well, I don't want to think about them, you know? So those are some thoughts on that one. Great question. Okay, next. Oliver, is it necessary to believe Christ literally dematerialized? I've read that he actually survived and went on to Nepal, but couldn't all the symbolisms be the same without him actually dying? Uh, I don't know what is necessary to believe. Um, Swedenborg talks about people within the Christian tradition, there's an importance for believing that. For people outside the Christian tradition, there is um, there is their own sort of structure of belief that can lead to heaven. Almost any structure of belief can lead to heaven as long as you are living it in integrity by what you believe is true and good. So if you actually think uh, that, that that happened, then, then so it goes. Swedenborg... Well, in, in Swedenborg, he, he didn't, like, dematerialize because he could come back, although he doesn't. So it's it's kind of a complicated thing. He, Swedenborg doesn't say anything about Nepal, but my point is live in love and follow the truth as you understand it. That's the best thing I can tell you. I, I don't know the specifics. I don't think, I think what matters more is are you trying to follow God as you best understand? Are you trying to love the human race. My personal thoughts on that. Thanks for the question, Oliver. Next, Scott Curtis, does Swedenborg believe that there is but one Son, one Christ, one Spirit? Are we it since we are one with Him in God? Uh, so, Swedenborg certainly believes that there is one Son, Son being a representative word for human manifestation of God. Uh, and one spirit, meaning there's only one life force. I mean, all of our life... So in that way, we're all one. Um, now, as far as how that gets combined further, it's tricky. I mean, we, we, have, we have... There's some point in us that is autonomous. Like, all of our life comes from God, but we can choose to accept or reject things. So we're not quite one-one in that way. However, Swedenborg talks about heaven as being like a person. Maybe you've heard that. We did a show called The Shape of Heaven. We've mentioned it a lot, that heaven functions like a person. Swedenborg says, actually, heaven is the image of God, meaning, in a way, heaven is the body of Christ. So we, the goal of going to heaven is to be a participant in that body, and so to be in Christ. 
So yes, no, and God is trying to make that more and more of a reality all the time, that we we and God willingly become one and, and all become happier and happier and happier as a result. So hope I got what you're asking right, and there's my answers. Cool. Next. Sam, when Jesus is on the torture stake or cross, who is he talking to when he says, God, have you forsaken me? And that is, I believe we covered this in our show called The Spiritual Battles of Jesus Christ with the cross part. Briefly, Swedenborg says that Jesus went through two general states in his life, uh, exodination and glorification, one in which he was in touch with the human frail side of himself that he was working to glorify, and the other where he was in touch with the divine side of himself. When he was in the more frail human state, by design, so that he could do all this stuff we're talking about, then he was cut off from his own self, his own divine knowledge. So when he was in that state, he would say, why have you forsaken me, like he was something separate from God, and that we go through similar states ourselves. Uh, You may have noticed, if you're on some kind of spiritual path, Sometimes it's clicking, or any kind of moral path, you're trying to be a better person. Sometimes it's really clicking, you, you've made progress, you, you really are your best self. Other times, oh, I snapped and yelled at that, I'm not doing well now. Those are our own miniature versions of those two states, when we feel disconnected from what's good and true in us, uh, it seems to be in us, and when we feel connected to it. So according to Swedenborg, that, that's who he's talking about. But see that episode, Spiritual Battles of Jesus Christ, uh, I think there's more about that in there. Good question. Next one. Yoga Po, I guess I've never considered this yet, but does Swedenborg say that angels can rise to a higher tier in heaven? Can a spiritual angel become celestial? That, I don't know. It would seem like, Swedenborg doesn't talk, he talks about communities moving in heaven, he talks about a whole community being uprooted, but then again, he also talks about uh, that everybody sort of forms... The, their container while they're on earth, and that can be filled out more and more forever, but but y- y- you don't, like, open a new level to it because you expand within that. However, on the other hand, you would think God wants to pull everybody in, and that veil in the temple getting split, that's when the, when the veil, I believe, when the veil is intact, that's a symbol of the, the celestial heaven, and then the spiritual heaven, and the natural heaven around the tabernacle. So... Is that a symbol of eventually the the barriers between the heavens breaking down? What about the new heaven? Is that is that different? I I don't know. The answer is I don't really know. That's why you come to me with questions. Okay, next one. How many heavens does Swedenborg say there are, and could more be created in the future? It's a tricky question. Well, he sort of says three. I mean, he says that there's the celestial, spiritual, and natural. Now, those are like the levels of heaven, like how you, there's three levels in the human mind, and depending on how many of those you've opened to God, that's how what, what level you're on there. There's individual communities within those, which are little heavens in their own, which are countless, and there's individual people where heavens in miniature, those are countless. However, Swedenborg also talks about a new heaven being formed uh, with this new church that he's predicting. I would assume that would fall within those three categories already, but as we've seen in this story, certainly seems like new heavens, if the spiritual heaven was created here, seems like there could be new heavens created in the future, and it could be that someday there's a heaven that's created where everyone is on the same level, can all communicate well. I don't know, God's probably got some plans that that uh, would be fun to see, and, and we all will uh, at some point. All right, let's do two more. Uh, Iris, what do some people claim they have gone to hell and witnessed all the suffering? Oh, man, we just did a show about this. This show is called The Good Thing About Hell, so if you go check that out, you'll see exactly what... I, I can't answer the question better than that. Just on our channel, The Good Thing About Hell, or just look at our videos, you'll see it just previously to that. It could be that those people were seeing hell and sort of understood it, sort of didn't. Please check out that episode. Okay, last one. Cassie, I recently purchased one of your books on the symbolism in the Bible. Do you believe that the meaning of those symbols are static, as in once they are learned, can they be translated the same way in every instance? Oh, I wish it was... It's not quite that simple. Um, Because you can... I mean, you can learn Swedenborgian correspondences that, uh, you know, let's say 
the the sun symbolizes God. Uh, stone symbolizes either falsity or truth. Um, water symbolizes either falsity or truth, but in a slightly different way. Seven symbolizes complete. Those kinds of things. Um, except you can sort of go at that and, and try to pick some things. That Egypt symbolizes uh, factual knowledge and, and the the lower rational. You can kind of start to tease things out. But the way, if the more you get into his description, he says that the the context for things matters and the overall narrative matters and it changes and it's it's like a very complex language. You can start to build things uh, that get get you insight, but what I would say is going into that, learn some of those things, but then the way to study correspondences is know a few things, and re- but read it w- with an open mind, with sort of a humble attitude, with a thought that I'm trying to learn this to do good, and then insight from heaven can flow in, and that's how we really get, because there's all these different layers of meanings that he describes too, so it's, it, there's, it's, it's complex, but but yet you can still, I find at times, you can just go and, oh, I think this means this, so that probably means something, like I get these sort of hazy things, and I do think you could learn, but it's not quite as simple as this always means this, there, there's a little more, just like with our words, there's, um, depending on contractions and endings, words can mean different things, so good luck with that, Hope you, and, and, and let us know how, how it goes if you continue to study that. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. This was a this was a heavy one, and it was a lot of fun for me to think about and do. So it's really it's amazing that there's people who want to stick around and watch it. So that's my dream come true. Thanks for making it come true. Next week we're going to be looking at three conversations with angels. This is directly reported from Swedenborg's works. We're going to see what are angels talking about, how do they talk about it, what's it like to be an onlooker. So hope you'll join us then. I'll see you next week.